Christine Lagarde has shattered the glass ceiling multiple times over. In becoming France's economy minister, she made history as the first woman to serve as a finance chief of a G7 nation. She's also the first woman to lead the International Monetary Fund and is now the first woman to be elected president of the European Central Bank. Last year, Forbes ranked her as one of the three most powerful women on the planet. I sat down with Christine Lagarde in New York for this edition of Leaders with L'Aqua, a month before she starts her new role in Frankfurt. As you leave the IMF and prepare for the ECB, what is one word of advice you'll take with you? I think I would start with teamwork. This is something which I believe has, has always helped me harness the consensus and uh, take any institution that I have led uh, further and forward. Um, it did help enormously at the IMF and you're only strong and convincing if you are strong at home. So making sure that we are a team, that we disagree amongst ourselves, and then once the disagreement is settled, once there is a common line, that we all move together, I think that, that has a huge impact. So teamwork would be my, my first. I think the, the second one that I would take away is learn how to listen. And that is certainly something that has served me well and that has served and I hope will continue to serve the IMF well. Listen to the policymakers, listen to their hardship, which is always when the IMF got involved, but listen to the people as well and try to understand multiple voices, including the unusual and unexpected voices. So this is what, communication? To, to, to make people feel like you're closer to them or negotiation actually to find consensus? You know, it's first of all, uh, listen enough so that you can put yourself in the other person's shoes. It's, I think it's always um, a healthy principle in either establishing relationship, in negotiating, in trying to help in one way or the other. Listen enough to put yourself in the other person's shoes. And then you understand her or his perspective, their perspective, uh, what they, what, where they can move, where they can't move, uh, what difficulty they're facing. So it's, it's not just for communication purposes at all. It's really to, um, to be able to to establish the relationship. Now, we talk about a lot about the art of the deal, right? In, in this situation, is there a danger that you know one party gives up too much, or do you, do you have red lines? How do you approach negotiations? I think when when you work in an institution, as I have um, over the you know the past fifteen years, you know that you have a mandate. And you start from that mandate, which in and of itself limits your negotiation um, room. And it gives you the red lines beyond which you can't go. Now, the weakness of that position is that the other side is aware of it. So I think it's one of the reasons why to, uh, you have to really listen hard to what the other party says, what the other party doesn't say, what are the innuendos, what is between the lines, so that you can also understand their position and try to reach a common goal. How do you think you've changed the IMF? I think I have, in addition to forging better teams and, you know, um, inter and intra-departmental improved work, I think I have helped enlarge the horizon and strengthen some policies. I think on the horizon, uh, I have made sure laboriously but tenaciously that things that were considered as non-core, as I've heard so many times, like impact of climate change, impact of women empowerment, relationship between growth and inequality, role of corruption, um, for instance, were actually macro-critical in many cases. So that's what I mean by enlarging the horizon. I don't think that um, economists would challenge that women can actually significantly contribute to the economy and enlarge the pie. I don't think that many people would dispute that corruption has to be factored in when auditing and prescribing policies for a country. I don't think anybody, well, very few people, would question that climate change has a huge impact and requires fiscal measures. I don't think anybody would question that, uh, that's another area, that, that financial 
uh, stability is going to be impacted by uh, fintech and new technologies. So those are, you know, to name a few, some of the um, areas where I have tried to enlarge the horizon. And my legacy will only um, be vindicated if those issues are never called non-core issues, but become part and parcel of the work that is done uh, on a regular basis by policymakers and, and by the IMF. You've often called the IMF an institution with a heart, a brain, and a wallet. And, and a wallet. Yeah. Is that the way that you actually legitimize and bring some of these big institutions with a lot of power closer to the people? Yes, I think that, that has been the approach. Um, I think everybody knows about the wallet because the IMF is called into action when a country is in a desperate situation and there is no other game in town, nobody to lend, nobody to finance, and it has exhausted its, its set of resources. That's well known. I think the brain is assumed, uh, but not necessarily displayed in, in all its different uh, facets. And the, the, the amount of capacity uh, building uh, that we do, uh, capacity development, training, uh, gender budgeting, for instance, um, debt management, I mean, you just name it. And the heart is, is a dimension that is often uh, underestimated. And I, I, I think I've made a point, and I will continue to remind my, my colleagues of the fact that behind numbers, behind statistics, you have people. You have vulnerable people who will be impacted by whatever recommendations you give. When you suggest to remove subsidies, for instance, it's going to look good in the numbers because there will be more fiscal space. Well, you have to think about who is going to be most impacted, how you can anticipate, how you can mitigate the impact on, on, on those people. Coming up, lessons from the Euro crisis. Christine Lagarde reflects on a tumultuous decade in Europe as she prepares to lead the European Central Bank. On November 1st, Christine Lagarde takes over as president of the European Central Bank. And after years of extraordinary monetary policy, the economy still looks like it needs support. But a crisis in Europe is a familiar story for the former head of the IMF. What lessons did she learn from the European debt crisis? And what are her key influences as she looks to steady the Eurozone? Christine Lagarde is still with me. When you got the call to lead the ECB, was there any hesitation? Yes, there was. I was, I was hesitant for essentially two reasons. One is I love the job I did at the IMF, and I loved working with the people at the IMF. Um, the relationship we built over time with staff and the, the, the standing that the institution acquired as a result of that it, it was well positioned, no question, but I think that you know, we, through hard work and, and, and quality focus and, and uh, um, the wallet, the brain and the heart, I think we gave it even more legitimacy and maintained it at the core of the global financial safety net. So that was one, one, one reluctance that I had. The second one was the thing that everybody assumed oh, she's never been a central banker before. How can she do that job? And, you know, I, I'm not an idiot and I'm not, I don't have enough vanity to assume that I can, I can do anything. So I, I talked to a lot of people who had been central bank governors, whom I trusted and who knew the job. Uh, and they all supported me and they all confirmed that, yes, under current circumstances and given the strength of the institution, and the situation we are in in Europe, I had to say yes. Because you had to say yes because you were the right person, because you're also a female leader, the first female leader of the... I don't think the female factor was critically important. It may have been when people do their sort of casting type of thing. I think f from all those whom I have spoken to, former central bank governors, current central bank governors, um, the point that they made very clearly to me, and which I, I believe as well, is that 
a lot of um, diplomatic skills, political sense, understanding of the perspectives of finance ministers and, and Euro country leaders, all of that will matter probably more than a deeply acquired, ingrained um, market experience or monetary policy uh, determination. I've, I've seen monetary policy uh, players um, at their game for the last so many years. And I was a finance minister myself for four years. So I've, I've seen that. And I think that there is a, a, such a strong and intelligent and powerful staff within the institution that I will get the right support, the right expertise. There's a fantastic uh, member of the board, Philip Lane, who was himself former governor of the uh, Central Bank of Ireland. And the board members are talented in their own respects as well as staff, which is really solid. So I, you know, I will try to listen to alternative voices as well, because that's a, that's a must. But uh, I, I, I'm looking forward to, uh, to working with all, the, all of them. Um, in, the last, in your last eight years at IMF, who's a leader that's, that stayed in your mind the most? The Pope. I know it's surprising, because um, Pope Francis is not necessarily a financial actor. He's not a market maker, but in terms of leadership, uh, he commands huge respect and uh, has obviously the, his spirituality, um, which I happen to share, but he has also a societal vision, uh, which I share in many respects. Not all, uh, but in, in many respects. I, 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 I admire him a great deal. The leader who's, whom I used to admire enormously and who disappointed me in many ways is um, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi from Myanmar. Uh, and, and those are the two extreme, if you will. What, what did you learn from your disappointment? I don't know how to explain it, because I still don't understand, um, given the background and the strength of her position, why she ended up where she has ended up now. But. Do you remember the first time you met President Trump, either on a phone call or in person? No, I met him in person. It was a, a G7 meeting in uh, Tower Mina. Um, and we, had, um, we actually had a really sort of deep and serious conversation about Greece. Uh, I think he had just met uh, Prime Minister Tsipras and had heard from him about Greece. And he wanted to uh, discuss and check a few things and, uh, and understand better the position of the IMF vis-a-vis -vis Greece. How, how was Greece for you? So, in the height of the euro crisis, was there ever a day where you thought, actually, you know, Europe is not going to make it through? Oh yeah, I mean, there was one night in in, in May of, I have to remember when it was. Two thousand must have been two thousand ten or so, because I was still finance minister. No. I was a member of the G seven. There was this uh, European finance ministers meeting. Uh, there was a G7 going on and I was on the phone and in the room and getting out of the room to check with G7 colleagues and you know we were seeing the clock moving and you know the Sydney markets opening the uh, the Tokyo markets opening the Hong Kong I mean it was like you know we've got to come out with something and that's how the uh, the, the sort of the embryonic ESM was formed um, at the time. So that, that night, I think many of us felt that the euro was gone and, and the eurozone was going to be in a, in a, in a, uh, in a downfall. Um, was it openly talked about? Was, it, was there a phone call where you said, actually, I'm, I'm really worried about our future? And so we it was no because it was so much. Um, it was so laborious. We were struggling with uh, the draft of the agreement. We were uh, anxious about keeping the right balance. We were keen to keep everybody on board. Um, there were some non-eurozone members in the room who mattered because the an, another stability fund had been used before, and they had to be part of the the equation. I don't think we had. We, we did not formalize it. Uh, saying, guys, the euro is at stake, but we all knew it, and and we we negotiated, and we uh, 
we progressed with that in mind. I mean, it's amazing to see how far Europe has come. And yet, are you worried that Europe can't withhold the next downturn? Do, do we have the, the right system in place? I think Europe and the Eurozone in particular have to, have to go a, a little further. And it's, I mean, you're very familiar with Europe. It's been a continuum. Uh, and there have been high momentum, slow momentum. Uh, but it, it has to be a continuum. And more needs to be done uh, to complete the You've heard that many times. Complete the banking union, make sure that there is a European security market that is deeper and, and broader. Um, having enough of a fiscal space that is in common, however you call it, uh, but that can be used eventually to stabilize. Uh, I think all those three, which are not particularly glamorous and sexy for the European citizens, but constitute the foundation and the infrastructure upon which uh, they can be development and they can be security. Up next, Lagarde's legacy at the IMF. We discuss her biggest successes and regrets as she reflects on her time leading the institution. More next. Christine Lagarde has risen through the ranks of international finance, from France's finance ministry to the IMF and now the ECB. She rebuilt the IMF's image under difficult circumstances, including the impact of the financial crisis and global aftershocks. Her legacy includes turning off the taps to Greece and the $57 billion high-risk bailout of Argentina. But what does she think was her biggest success and what would she do differently with hindsight? Christine Lagarde is still with me. Any regrets in the IMF dealing? Let me tell you first, and I'll come to your question, I promise. The IMF has helped 90 countries in the last eight years with programs, 90, nine zero, and has committed half a trillion dollars to help those countries. There have been great successes, there have been moderate successes, there have been work in progress. And in the case of Argentina, you know, we, we did the best we could at the time when Argentinian leaders came to us with a very difficult situation. Back in May 2018, um, it was an extremely difficult situation. And through that program, which had downside effects, you know, increased poverty, high inflation. There was renewed stability. They reduced the balance of payment deficit. They reduced the fiscal deficit and they accumulated reserves. And the special thing about that program is that we had anticipated that it would hurt and we had inserted in the program uh, enough of uh, social safety protection and a valve that could actually be activated in order to increase uh, safety measures for the most vulnerable people. So we, we really tried to anticipate as much as we can. And um, unfortunately, the most recent developments that were triggered by a political development have proven very difficult for the, uh, for the people and the country. Do you think the IMF in general gets an unfair time I mean, we'll, the, you know, the, the IMF, the IMF always gets a tough time um, whenever a program is moderately successful or not successful. And it is never mentioned when a program is superbly successful. Who remembers that IMF was very active in Ireland? Who remembers that IMF was very active in Portugal? Who remembers that IMF was very supportive of Jamaica? And I could name a whole you know, uh, list of countries this is the fate of the institution, to be the scapegoat uh, when things go wrong and to be criticized ex post by those wonderful economists who did not utter a word at the time when the IMF gets involved. But that's, that's the way it is. It goes with the, the, the job. Why is it so difficult for economists to predict recessions or downturns? Because generally they work at least at the moment, they work on the basis of, um, of the past. You, you are informed by past numbers, by past 
uh, behavior by past policies. And, and to actually model that uh, is, is informing without taking into account you know, the, the black swan mm -hmm. or, or the, 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 the major triggering factor that will not be in, in the model. So that puts them in, in, a, in a hard position to actually predict the unpredictable. Uh, what kind of advice are you giving the new managing director of the IMF? She, uh, you know, I, I, I'm very grateful that it is very likely to be a she. Uh, she is very talented. She has a, a proven track record of good leadership. And, and I know that she's fantastically well-intentioned in focusing the institution uh, to deliver on its mission and to serve the membership. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be available anytime on the phone if ever she has, uh, you know, doubt or wants check to check things. But I think she's fully and well equipped. I mean, you, so you mentioned the 90 countries. Out of everything you've had to deal with, is there something that strikes you, uh, strikes you as, you know, actually quite incredible that you wouldn't have predicted the outcome. I'm thinking of Brexit, which was started three and a half years ago. I'm thinking of, you know, China trade war, or, or is there something else? If I look at the institution, at the IMF, I was working very hard to make sure that China would be included as much as possible in the institution, because it is the second largest economic power, and it is better to have that economic power play inside the tent rather than not. Uh, so the inclusion of the renminbi in the basket of currencies that form the special drawing right, which is, OK, jargonic terms again, but it's essentially the currency of the IMF, that was not a given. Um, that the Jamaica programs succeeded in the way they did through sheer determination, collective ownership, uh, and uh, re-establishing uh, stability in that country was not a given, and it happened. Uh, did we predict some of the developments, such as uh, the trade war between US and China? No. No, we did not. And I think that if there is one important short-term economic development that I would really wish for, it would be a settlement of those differences with obviously compromises and concessions and, and willingness to approach all the issues, but certainty to be re-established, rules to be played by, and a framework within which operators can decide, can invest, can go further. Is that the same for Brexit? I'm at a loss as to what is going to happen, but clearly Brexit uncertainty is questioning many economic decisions on both sides of the channel. You've done so much for female leadership. How much more do we need to go from here? A lot more. A lot more is needed, and it's a constant challenge. Um, you know, when I look at the numbers, when I talk to the entrepreneurs, when I talk to young women out of, out of school, when I talk to young girls trying to struggle to get an education in low-income uh, countries, there is a lot more than can be done, and there is a fantastic potential to be had because because poverty is sexist because women uh, are an economic no-brainer and because it is a macro dimension madame lagarde thank you so much for joining us today thank you